Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Pat I'm an alcoholic. I'm also a Florida girl. When Terry and I talked and she asked me, she gave me a couple of choices of things to talk about at the workshop here, and one of them was relying on women, and immediately I dismissed that. Um, I, I didn't like women, so there was no point in me talking about relying on women. And then I thought for a second, and I said, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk on that, because after I had a few seconds to reflect, my attitude toward women is sort of a little bit of what has what it was like and what happened to me and what it's like now because my relationship with women, really my relationship with myself, has changed dramatically over the years. When I was uh, a little girl, I was named after my mother and father's best man, Patrick. And uh, I always felt like they were a little bit disappointed because I was not a man. And uh, they always would tell me the story, and, and they would tell me that Patrick was six feet four and, and just a giant of a man, and I was a pretty insignificant little toddler. My, I was the only grandchild for 12 years, and I loved that. Um, I had a half-sister But she was always at her father's, and I would go up to my grandparents where all the uncles and two aunts were. I loved that because I was the only kid. But I observed a lot of things there, too. Uh, One was my grandmother was so partial to my uncles over my aunts, it was unbelievable. They lived in a a farmhouse in, in Tennessee. And uh, the house was heated by fireplaces and coal stoves. And my grandmother would tell my aunts to go outside and bring in the wood. And my aunts would laugh and say, what about uh, their brothers? And my grandmother would say, oh, they've been working hard all week. You all go out and get them. And my aunts would go out and get the wood. And then after after dinner, my uncles and my dad would all sit around in the main room and they would uh, have an after-dinner drink or, or smoke. Oh, man, I thought that was so neat. And the women cleaned up. And I learned real fast what it was like to be a woman when I was little. And I didn't think the women had any fun at all. And the men would, would sit there and they'd play chess and they'd talk about important things. And the women cleaned up. Um, I, I just really didn't think women... I would ask Mother, you know, what, what she you know, was and everything, and she would just be a housewife. And the words always just were bitten off of her tongue. And I didn't think women were very important at all. And when I was little, I really didn't like women at all. I I wanted to to be more important than that. I liked men. Besides, my uncles played with me. And one uncle played with me a little bit too much and uh, gave me what I call a hole in my soul. I was was not an incest victim. I'm, I'm an incest survivor. But uh, the love that I thought that he was giving me was actually uh, to satisfy his own sick pleasure. But I got love and sex and all kinds of things like that real mixed up in my head when I was real little. But I didn't know that men were something that I wanted to please. And the only person that was a threat to the men in my life were women. So I learned very, very early not to like women. And I didn't. When I hit adolescence, uh, my mother was very, very, very reticent about telling me what it was like to be a woman. I don't think my mother liked being a woman very much sometimes. And uh, I was really unprepared for uh, menstrual cycles and, and nice things like that. And I remember when, when I got my first period, I thought I died. 
You know, <laughs> some of you may have gone through some one of the symptoms. I really thought I had died. No one told me. And so I waited about a day and because I, my family also was a family of secrets. And I thought maybe if I just didn't talk about this, it was just going to go away. And it didn't. And uh, I learned about the curse. Remember those words? And I got another reason not to like women real fast, you know. And my mother was of the old school, and, and I couldn't wash my hair. God forbid, take a bath when you've got the curse. And, and so, um, you know, the, the deal, I couldn't shave my legs then because that was too close to, like, wearing makeup. And nice girls didn't wear makeup until they were 16, so I had hair everywhere and this curse. And... Uh, <laughs> I just knew that being a woman was the pits, <laughs> and it was. I went to Catholic schools. I'm a recovering Catholic, too. <laughs> and I was taught by Catholic nuns when they still wore the long black robes, and their reason for being was to make sure that we were educated and that we didn't think of sex or boys or life or anything normal, and uh, they helped me. I, I decided that I was going to be a nun, that, that was going to take care, because nuns obviously didn't have the curse. Uh, <laughs> they, they just couldn't have had the curse, you know, they just too religious. Um, there was a girls' club in, in my little Catholic private school, and there were three girls that were not admitted to the girls' club, and I was one of them. And uh, God, I'll never forget that. I don't think I've ever cried more in my life. I stopped crying soon after that, though. I learned not to cry. And um, the nuns came to my rescue. They made the girls take the three of us that had not been admitted into the club. They made us be in members. And so you know what the other girls thought of us. And so there was another chalk mark up for the enemies of Pat Brantley. You know, but I was Pat Nichols then, and, and she really knew she didn't like women then. Uh, I struggled through high school, and I learned to um, be an overachiever by God. If I couldn't be one of the girls, then I could be smart, and I was. And I graduated second in my class and, and did all the, the real high achiever things and started off to college at the University of Tennessee and uh, was trying to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, and everything I wanted to do, I was told that women didn't do those things. Remember, this is in the 50s, 1958, as a matter of fact. And I was not permitted to do those things. And I would, you know, the exciting things, the fun things, the things that had the power and, and moved and, and, and were the, the important, the fun things. And um, so finally I decided I wanted to be a stewardess. My father told me the best thing I could do would be go to college, meet some nice man and get married and settle down. And I did. I think that's the first time I was a good girl. And I did. I went to college, but I... Uh, and I got married in my third year, at the end of my third year. But I discovered something while I was in college. I, I discovered alcohol. And um, when I had a couple of drinks in me, the men liked me better. You know, I was cuter. And uh, I said all those cute, clever things. And uh, I, I was first on the dance floor and last to leave. I got drunk a couple of times. They carried me out of a football game. <laughs> it was on television. Uh, <laughs> my parents wanted to know who that poor drunk was in the stands. I didn't tell them it was me, but it was. But that's what everybody did. It was no big deal. That's what everybody did back then. My school was the one of the top ten party schools in the country. It was rated by Playboy magazine, and that's important. <laughs> and I was popular, something I'd never had. And I equated popularity with alcohol. But I married uh, a man who had all the things that I thought were really important. He had status in the community in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And um, he played golf, and, and he was well-known. And through him, I could be somebody. I was always trying to, to fit in. And uh, so for 10 years, I lived that life. Uh, I did have two wonderful daughters, and I tried to do the mother thing. I never really felt that comfortable 
doing the mother thing because all the women would sit around and talk about babies and, you know, how cute the throw-up was and all this other stuff. And I really just didn't think the women were too important. You know, surely there was more to talk about than just baby poop. Um, <laughs> but that's what they liked, I thought. And I thought I was so different. And I sat there and I'd say the cute things and, and I was never there. And the, but I did have alcohol. I drank through my pregnancies. The Surgeon General hadn't given us any kind of warning. I smoked through my pregnancies too. Uh, thank God. And it's only by the grace of God that my daughters are normal, recovering, but normal, whatever that means. Uh, the marriage lasted ten years. I could only live a lie so long, you know. And, uh, the marriage failed and, and, um, I went back to school and, and got a degree and I was going to be a social worker because I was still in the 50s mode of what is acceptable to a woman to do. And I did that for a while, didn't like it, and then went back and tried to still figure out what I was going to be when I grew up. I had two daughters that liked to eat and uh, I had to do something, so I got certified to teach school. Once again, a, a acceptable feminine type of job. And I, I did that and raised my daughters. And then I decided I was going to be the world's greatest school teacher. I could be something if I was the world's greatest school teacher. And I taught in an inner city school. And I was going to save all those folks from life, from teenage pregnancy, from abusive parents, single parent homes, alcoholism, drugs. I, I was going to save the world. And um, I, I didn't do that. But I, I, my, I drank a little bit more. And um, it got easier to go to school in the morning, and it was hard. And I realized after one year that I wasn't saving anybody. And maybe if I was lucky, I could save myself. And I, and I still didn't have an identity. I really didn't feel like a mother, and I really didn't feel like a career person. And I really didn't like women, and I was just kind of stuck in some sort of a limbo land. But... Um, I lived with a guy for about five years, and, and I became his little appendage, you know. And, and all of his friends became my friends. And uh, what he wanted to do, I did. And, and uh, I just kind of followed along, and it, it was great. And, and um, I hadn't been drinking for about five years. And one thing he did do that I hadn't done in a long time was drink. And uh, so I started drinking again, and, and it was just great. Because once again, I could say those bright things, and I had just forgotten how much alcohol relaxed me. <laughs> and uh, I, I lived that life for for a few years too. And and um, then he he left, and and I was caught with no identity. I was just kind of stuck with myself again, and I never really liked being with just me. It was just real real hard. Because I didn't know who I was. I just knew I didn't like myself. And I, I can remember thinking that I was seafoam. I don't know why that came to my mind, but I always thought I was seafoam. Because, you know, seafoam would blow and it would bend itself into shapes. And then it would blow here and it would light a while and be that shape. And then it would move over there and be there for a while and be that shape. But it had no substance and that's the way I felt so much. So um, I have a, a couple of recourses that I take when I'm backed into corners, and one of them is to do what I do well, and that's go to school. So I enrolled in graduate school, and that was fun. Uh, I decided that I was going to make a four-point in graduate school while I worked full-time, and I decided I was going to go to graduate school in two years, and I did. And I damn near killed myself. But I did those things because um, I wanted to be Miss Graduate School. And I, I could have an identity doing that. I could do something. And people would look at me and be important. In the meantime, my sister had come down with uh, ovarian cancer. And this was in 1986. I was still drinking. I, I drank a lot. I needed to drink then, you know, because I was under such stress. I wasn't an alcoholic, though, because I didn't drink in the morning, and I worked, and I had a job. I drank a lot at night, uh, smoked a little dope sometimes, and I would still go to bed, and, and my eyes would be this big, 
and I would be just lying on the bed trying to make myself relax. I can remember that now, and I, and I could think of how many papers I had to do and how many books I had to get read, and I kept piling more and more work on myself so I could be somebody, and, and I would finally find a place that I fit in and that people liked me and that I would finally meet approval. And um, so I, I went through graduate school, and my sister had just this little problem with cancer. In my family, we always minimized things a lot, too. And uh, it was really going to be no big deal. You know, they were just going to give her a little operation in her abdomen, and they got about 95% of it, and everything was going to be okay. I, I didn't know about ovarian cancer then, so being someone who lives in her head a lot, I, I set about buying books and, and trying to find everything I could find about cancer. And what I found out was a book by Bernie Siegel called Love, Medicine, and Miracles. And every other line it said seemed to talk about meditation and God and, and stuff that I thought I had tried to forget for a long time because I walked away from the Catholic Church when I got divorced. And they told me they were going to kick me out if I ever remarried. They could let the priest get married, but I couldn't get remarried, and, and I didn't want to play that game. So um, I started reading everything I could find my hands on about ovarian cancer, and all I found out were books about God and meditation. And I, I don't know why that happened. I know now, but I didn't at the time. I, I just thought it was one of those nice coincidences. And... The one little operation turned out to be another little operation, and the roller coaster ride got a little steeper on the upgrades and a little lower on the downclines when we found out that my sister's cancer was just a little bit more serious than we had thought. And graduate school was going well. I still hadn't made anything but A's, and I was the darling of the graduate school, and the little professors patted me on the head. And I went to my job, and I was Miss Education in Chattanooga, sort of to speak. And uh, I was winning teaching awards and everything, and I would go home and shut my door and drink. And be so afraid that somebody would find out who I was. Um, some of those friends that belonged to the, the guy that I lived with for a while, they came back to see me too, and two of them raped me. And so now I was both an incest survivor and a rape survivor, but I managed to forget about those things. They just were a couple of little unimportant things that had happened along life's journey for me. But I was, things were going well in graduate school, and my sister's cancer was just a small thing, and it was going to get better. And uh, graduate school was looming close, and the comprehensive exams were not too far away. And my sister was going to take this little trip up to see the top cancer specialist on ovarian cancer in New York. And it finally dawned on me that she was not going to make it. You know, this was just not one of those little nasty things that was going to go away. And so I made a decision. I was going to save my sister. I could do it. I could do everything because I thought I could. I didn't know who I was, and I had no identity, no self-esteem, but I was going to save my sister and my mother and my father and the world, if someone had thrown that in at the time, I, I just didn't know enough people to throw in the world, I guess. Um, I made the decision in, 19, in the spring of 1988, one week after my comprehensive exams, that um, I was going to move to Florida. And I did. August of 1988. August the 6th, as a matter of fact. Uh, my sister came to see me. She, by that time, she had another blockage in her lower abdomen. For a year, she had been fed through a port in her clavicle. And, you know, we never talked like sisters. We never shared like sisters. And she was a woman, you know, and I just didn't really identify with women at all. 
Uh, she wasn't the enemy, but most women were the enemy. They were people who hurt me, and I felt alienated from them. And I really didn't like me, and I was a woman, and so I did not like them either. And my sister and I had, we shared a mother, but that was really about it. And um, after I had been in Florida for a month, I just fell apart one night. And I was drunk. And I realized that all those familiar things that I could do in Chattanooga without thinking my job, I had no ground to stand on. It was awful. And I knew that I was an alcoholic. So I called the intergroup office hotline. And this nice man sent me two nice ladies the next day I called in sick. And I was never real bad about calling in sick before when I had drunk too much. I would go to school with this roaring head hangover, and I would tell my students that the teacher didn't feel too well that morning. And I would pop down mints so no one could smell my breath. I drank vodka because it was a lot easier to, to disguise it the next day, you know. And... uh you know, I understand that alcoholics have to be very good at what we do on the outside, you know, when we're drinking, because I was so much of a basket case, and I was so afraid that someone would find out that I could leap tall buildings. And I knew I could leap tall buildings. And I would brag about leaping tall buildings. And no one knew me because inside I was just dying. Two nice, wonderful ladies came up to my house and they took me to my first AA meeting. It was a women's meeting, wouldn't you know it? (laughs) Um, And I thought, gosh... Every woman in there told me a little bit about my life. And I remember thinking, what a neat, neat meeting that was. And I picked up my white chip. And then I said, well, I I may go back occasionally to the women's meeting, but I don't live in a world that's all women, so I'll go to some of these that have men and women. And, of course, in my area, and I guess it is in other areas, too, I'm I'm not that familiar with them, the meetings are predominantly male, very male-oriented in my area. Uh, But that was okay with me. I was, that was fine because I still didn't like women. I didn't really have that much in common with women, you know. I hung out with men. So... I launched my ship on the road to recovery. And I I did the AA thing really big time because I found the men real interesting. I I can remember walking to meetings and the the room would be lined with people in chairs. And there could have been five naked women in that room and I would have never seen them. (laughs) But I could have told you the name of every man in that room from just walking from the front door to the coffee pot, you know. (laughs) My peripheral vision as a school teacher, one does learn to develop excellent peripheral vision. And I could walk with my eyes right on that coffee pot and check out every man on the way down. And I did it too. Because, you know, I just really didn't have a lot in common with women. Uh, I hung out with men. So um, I, I stayed sober. They told me not to drink and go to meetings, and uh, the men were at the meetings, so I didn't drink, and I kept going to meetings. And I, But I took a couple of small, short detours on what I consider my road to recovery. Uh, nine months sober, and a man came into my life, and I knew he was bad news when he walked in, but... I could handle it. (laughs) They told me not to make any major changes and and to to bring a man about in my life. (laughs) I was unique. I was different. I could handle it. He walked in the door of my program, walked out the window. (laughs) And in, 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 
30 days. He was the person I listened to. He had five years of sobriety. Five years of sobriety. He just left his wife and had a string of affairs before and has had a fair string of affairs after me. But, you know, I was going to change him. I was going to make a difference. I was unique. Thank God my first sponsor told me that my program had gone to hell in a handbasket. And then he found another person with a little bit less sobriety than I even had at that time. And he went to save her and left me out in the cold. Did I blame him? Of course not. It wasn't his fault. She did it, you know. <laughs> that bitch <laughs> took him away from moi. <laughs> you know, men just wouldn't do anything like that to me. I always just, you know, men were important. They just did the important things. Women were insignificant. Men did no wrong. And um, so my daughter's sponsor recommended a book to me. It was called A Women Who Love Too Much. Recommend that book. And I did a crash course. I read it, and she told me to stay home and read it. And I learned one thing in AA early in sobriety, that when people told me to do something who had a lot of sobriety, I listened to them. And the willingness to listen has saved me from having to discover what it was like back out there again. I, I haven't had to do that. So um, she told me to read it that weekend. She said, you're not probably not doing anything. You just stay home and read that book. I went to the mall, swollen eyes and everything, because I'd been crying my heart out for this man, because this woman took him away from me. It was her fault. And so I took this book, and once again I read about me in this book. And realized that I had a big problem. Not only was I an alcoholic, but I had a real big problem with men in my life. I had a whole total distorted perception of men. And so I started looking at men in my life, starting from the little toddler named after Patrick, and, and started just looking at where I was with men in my life and realized that uh, I was really sick. I was about um, 11 months sober, and it dawned on me how truly sick I was and that alcoholism was a disease that I had, but I don't believe I ever would have picked up that first drink had I not had some of these other things eating away at my inside gut. So I swore off men, <laughs> changed my meeting schedule, and went to AA meetings for the right reasons. And then he came along. <laughs> Only this time he was married. And, uh, you know, when I was drinking and my worst behavior as a drunk, I never fooled around with married men because I always thought if he did it to her, he'd do it to me. But my need was so great and my addictive behavior and thought patterns had not been touched by me. I was working on a fourth step, but I was editing out a lot of things as I was, I was doing it to the best of my ability, truly. You know, it says rigorous self-honesty, rigorous honesty, and I believe for me that is self-honesty. I just didn't know about all this stuff. I'd forgotten about the incest. I kind of remembered the rapes. Sort of, kind of, maybe. Um, and for about six weeks, had an affair with a married man when I was 15 months sober. Again, a woman pointed out to me what I was doing. 
and it came as such a crushing blow to me once again to see how truly sick I was. And um, I went up this spring to visit my younger daughter in Virginia and made contact again with a, a friend of mine who predates me in the program by six months. I've known Linda for 26 years. We've been drunk together, and now we're sober together, and our babies were in diapers together, and we have long histories. And I was telling her about this affair, and uh, I was depressed. It's not exactly the right word. I couldn't understand why. I couldn't understand what it was that I needed so badly that I would violate principles that I had when I was drinking, when I had a program, and I felt like I was living a lie, and I was. I was Miss A.A. in my area, but I was living a lie. And I said, damn it, he should have protected me <laughs> once again. And Linda said, who in the hell do you think you are that any man is going to protect you? And it was like picking up another white chip for me. And she said, you might need to see somebody about some of these issues that you've got running around in your heart and in your soul, or you may go out there and drink again. And so I did. And I went to a therapist, a woman, and together we've been combating some of the demons inside of me and some of the issues that I've faced that are not real, real nice and happy. And, you know, a couple of nice things have happened. I've, um, I'm in the process now of reconstructing my history as a child, going back to square one. And I am seeing that at every corner of my life, my perception of women was shifted just enough that I saw women as less than valuable. And I neglected to see men in my life for what they were truly. I realized that so many of my women models were victims. I'm, I'm not saying that as a matter of blaming anyone. Blaming it, it is so foolish for me to even attempt to do because it gets me nowhere. And I'm into recovery now for the first time. Two years sober, but into recovery sort of brand new. And I find that as my self-esteem gets to be more and more, my admiration and respect and warmth and liking for women gets to be more and more. And, you know, it was so neat to come up here. About the first person I saw was Terry. And it was so neat to see her again and the faces that I've seen that I remember from last February. And if I could say that I'm looking forward to being here more right now than I did driving up in the car because I know why I came. Um... You reaffirm my existence now. I have a persona now. I've chosen now to be a part of the female species 
Because, you know, to deny my femininity, to deny my being a woman, was to deny my very self. It was to deny my soul. When I disliked you, when I felt contempt for you, and when I felt like you were less than, it was me that I saw, not you. You weren't the enemy, I was. Because everything that I was, I thought was invalid. I feel such strength from you. I came up with the Florida girls, and we sit in meetings together, and there is warm, loving care there. I have sat in my therapist's office as I attempted to reconstruct the incest in my life so I can get on the other side and forgive it and get on with it, you know? I am tired of these past burdens and I have to work through them to let them go. And I know I can do that now because I see me in your eyes. And I like what I see. I don't need a man in my life now. I used to could say, you know, I used to say, um, well, I hope someday God gives me someone to share my life with. I do share my life now. I don't have to wait. I don't know how many women are in this room. At least a hundred, I would say. I share my life with all of you. That is enough. I don't dislike men anymore. I don't hate them. Neither do I falsely place them on pedestals. I see them as just someone who is a lot like me, just a little bit physically different. That's about it. And it's funny now when I walk in those AA meetings and I'm going to the coffee pot and my peripheral vision hadn't changed. (laughs) It really hadn't. But now I see the women in the room. And there could probably be three or four naked men and I probably wouldn't notice but I could tell you who the women were in that meeting. You see, I'm learning to like me. And I've joined the female race. And I see the strengths. You know, many of us are survivors. Many of us have overcome more than just alcoholism. Well, that was a piece of cake. (laughs) You know, all I had to do was not drink and go to meetings. You know, that was easy. Overcoming life's been another, (laughs) another little sticky one. I am so grateful to each and every one of you for who you are and where you've been for being there for me when I didn't like you. When I had my little plastic smile on. Thank you for being there for me when I hurt and I didn't know why. I just knew that it hurt. Thank you for being for me when I went back and did the same thing again and again and again. Thanks for understanding and not saying, oh, won't she ever learn. I'm learning now. 
I remember last year at this workshop, I, someone said something at, at, at one of the meetings that has carried me through so much. And it was, your hell is your hell. And I feel like my recovery has been reflected in my feelings and my relationship with women. It's just, it's almost the same thing. I look forward to seeing you this weekend and in April, whenever I can get a chance to be in a woman's workshop. You will always be in my heart. Thank you, Terry, for letting me speak. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.